Hi, Working Preachers. This is Matt Skinner. We're getting close to the end of our fundraising campaign, but you still have time to make a difference for working preachers in 200 countries and territories around the globe. Thanks to two anonymous longtime Luther Seminary donors with a passion for preaching and for supporting new preachers, we have a matching gift available. As soon as we raise $25,000 toward this fall campaign, a $10,000 matching gift will be unlocked. Gifts of any size will make a tremendous difference. We know you rely on the resources that Working Preacher provides, so we're asking for your help now to keep Working Preacher thriving and improving. Your support helps ensure that Working Preacher remains free and available to all, no matter where they are. You can make a one-time gift or a monthly gift securely online at workingpreacher.org slash donate. Thank you for supporting this vital ministry. Welcome to our Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. This is the podcast for October 27th, 2024, which is either the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost, or if you come from a tradition that celebrates Reformation Sunday, this is Reformation Sunday. Always one of my favorite days, uh, weekends, minor festivals uh, of the year for myself. Uh, I love it. And the text is, and it's really fitting, the text is Solomon's dedication of the temple. So just first of all, so last week we had David's, uh, uh, David has, uh, he's won the kingship. He's moved the, uh, he's moved the, the Ark of the Covenant uh, to Jerusalem, he built himself a palace. He goes, oh, I should build God a temple now that I have a palace. And God says, nope, I'm going to build you a house, a dynasty. Your son will build the temple for me. And now this is the next week, and Solomon builds the temple. And so this is the house for the Ark of the Covenant. Um, it's fitting for Reformation, uh, before we actually get to the text, uh, selected verses from 1 Kings 5 and 8. It's sort of a long passage. You certainly don't want to read everything from First Kings 5 through 8, but you might, as you prepare to preach, uh, read the whole thing just for yourself. Yep. Here's why uh, one, of the, one of the connections uh, t- uh, with Reformation. The Reformation was started because the, the building of uh, St. Peter's uh, Cathedral in Rome was stalled. And it was stalled because they ran out of money, and they decided to raise money they were going to sell forgiveness in the form of indulgences to those backwards Germans over the Alps. And uh, Luther, of uh, course, objected to that. And boom, you get the Reformation. And uh, about 60 years ago, uh, when uh, Pope, Pope John XXIII John. called for a council, and they said, hey, we just had a council 100 years ago. We don't need a council. He says, we're having a council. Second Vatican, and he invited he invited uh, ecumenical observers. This is new to a Roman Catholic council, and uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, Lutheran observers uh, taught at the seminary where Luther Seminary, where the three of us are connected. His name was Warren Quanbeck, and as he processed in, he said, "This is fitting because this is where it all started. The Reformation mm. started with." Uh, you know, building the cathedral in Rome. And I think it's also fitting because just like the cathedral in Rome, that's that's a, like a really bad story for building a th- cathedral. And yet it's, so it's imperfect, like the temple, but also very important, wonderful, godly things have emanated from it. And so you've got this imperfect um, divine human uh, building, the temple, the cathedral, the church, us, our church today, our congregations. And so uh, how does God both use imperfect institutions, but also seek to reform them? All right, to the text. I think uh, the key part of this text is, what is this thing? In uh, the the key verses in chapter eight from the longer uh, prayer of dedication that uh, Solomon prays. And that is, I mean, right, first of all, the recognition of the Bible God is said to dwell in a temple, but hey, we all know 
God cannot dwell in the temple. Verse 27, even highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I've built, says Solomon. But you hear our prayers from here. And then, you know, um, there's examples. If there's a famine, when heaven is shut up, that is, if there's no rain, if the people have sinned against you. I think these various points still make uh, a point for us. You know, when we gather, what are our prayers for? And God hears them. And then I know you've got an insight on this, Catherine. In, in verse 41, it says, likewise, when a foreigner prays. Yeah, uh, uh, our, our commentator for this week, Jacqueline, Professor Jacqueline Lapsley, uh, makes this point, uh, I think, really quite well. So you can uh, read. We always suggest that you read those essays in addition to uh, listening to this podcast. But she talks about this passage here. Likewise, uh, this is First uh, uh, Kings 8, starting at verse 41. Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people, Israel, comes from a distant land because of your name, for they shall hear of your great name, your mighty hand, and your outstretched arm. When a foreigner comes and prays toward this house, then hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all that the foreigner calls to you so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your people, Israel, and so that they may know that your name has been invoked on this house that I have built." So what Professor Lapsley uh, talks about is uh, the importance uh, or the, the differing voices that we hear in, the, in Scripture, particularly in, uh, in the Old Testament, about foreigners. So uh, another voice that we might hear is Ezra and Nehemiah that seems very anti Foreigner, right? Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah says that the uh, the the uh, the the Israelites or the Jews at this point who have married foreign women need to divorce their wives. It's a, a very kind of strict sense of who uh, who Israel is, who the Jews are, uh, and uh, exclusive of those who are not Jews. And yet there are voices like this as well uh, in Solomon's prayer in places like Isaiah nineteen that speaks about. Um, Egypt and Assyria, these ancient enemies of Israel, worshiping God together with Israel. Uh, Isaiah 2, the nations coming to the mountain of the Lord's house, to this mountain uh, that uh, that Solomon has built the temple on. Uh, uh, the book of Jonah that talks about, you know, the repentance uh, uh, of even the people of, uh, of Nineveh, the, 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 the capital of the evil empire. We'll be talking about Jonah, I think, uh, next week or the week after. Uh, and uh, and other voices like this, and I I, I uh, agree with uh, Professor Lapsley that this is uh, this is one of those key texts. Uh, Isaiah talks about uh, the house of God being a house of prayer for all people as well. Uh, so um, Israel cannot claim God for themselves, right? For or, or or at least not only for themselves. They can claim God as the God of Israel. But God is not only the God of Israel. God is the uh, the God of all who pray to to God, um, uh, and especially those uh, the foreigners who come to the temple. Uh, you might read Isaiah fifty six in addition to this that uh, talk about the the eunuch uh, and the foreigner who keep the Sabbaths and who pray to God. This isn't universalism in the sense of you know, all paths lead to the same, you know, all paths up the mountain lead to the same place. That's not what either uh, First Kings or, uh, or Isaiah is saying. It's, it's this particular God, right? This particular, the God of Israel is the only true God. Uh, and this God is the God, not just of Israel, but of all peoples, right? Uh, so I, it's just important to make that uh, distinction especially in this age when we, uh, here in the United States, I know not all our, uh, of our listeners are from the uh, U.S., but uh, we have this ongoing problem or this emerging problem of Christian nationalism, uh, where some folks here claim that God is, uh, you know, God is for the U.S. Uh, uh, to the exclusion of other nations, and particularly that God is for a particular version of the United States or a particular people in the United States. So, uh, we want to we want to hear voices like this in scripture that talk about God hearing the voice of the foreigner, right? Hearing the voice of the non-Israelite uh, uh, when when they pray to God, and God 
uh, fulfilling God's promises and uh, bringing forth life and salvation for those people as well. Indeed. I'm going to piggyback on what you said, uh, Catherine, because I do believe, particularly in this moment, it's very important for us to attend to this. We talked last week about how the patterns of uh, of humanity, but we were particularly talking about David, seem to keep repeating that we fall short of God's glory. Um, and um, here we are in uh, the contemporary people of God who identify as Christians, um, centering more on nationalism and ethnicity, which is what the, the situation was in Ezra and Nehemiah, but it wasn't about God. It was about those who bear witness to God. And Solomon's prayer uh, actually is a prayer about God. It's a prayer about honoring who God is. And if God is honored, the honor of God means that others will recognize among all the gods that they have options, this is the only true God. This is the only true God. And that is a, a prayer that should draw attention that this isn't my God that does what I want, but this is the God and I am a witness. And when you see God, I'm not going to become a guard to keep you away. My whole reason for existing uh, is to be a witness that you might see or to use the words I like to use from Genesis chapter 12, this blessed nation is a blessing for all the other nations to know the creator who created them in his divine image. That's a great connection to draw joy back all the way back to Genesis 12, to that original promise to Abraham. He's blessed to be a blessing, you know, through you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We see mm -hmm. this worked out in this prayer of Solomon's and in many other passages in scripture. I Love to Tell the Story is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. The narrative lectionary was developed at Luther Seminary and has been hosted on Working Preacher since 2011. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash narrative. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.